Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar, thinking about moving to Portugal, a labor view on the new opportunities and challenges of remote work and professional visas presented in partnership between the Legal 500 and, and uh, TELUS. My name is Alan Cohen. I'm a research editor at the Legal 500. And before I hand over the webinar to our panelists, uh, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction of today's topic. In this uh, post COVID-19 era, uh, working remotely, as in working from anywhere, is gaining ground, and Portugal is uh, uh, taking the lead in setting up the new remote working framework with the uh, goal of tackling the challenges arising from the new uh, work arrangements. In this uh, webinar, TELUS will present a view of these new opportunities and challenges, including remote work and professional visas and uh, uh, Portuguese labour law. Uh, but first, let me introduce Gonzalo Pinto Ferreira and Vera Matos Ferreira, who will lead us through the discussion today. Uh, Gonzalo is uh, the head of CLS's uh, employment and social security practice. He advises domestic and international clients on all aspects of international law, uh, sorry, employment law, uh, but with a special focus on uh, strategic matters. He uh, regularly supports HR directors in dealing with procedures and the transfers of employees and on the new ways of working. I must uh, also add that uh, Gonzalo is frequently recognized as a leading lawyer by international publications and directories. Also joining us is Vera Matos Pereira. Vera is a senior associate at TELUS and she works with Gonzalo in the employment and social security practice. She advises on all aspects of employment law, got it right this time. Uh, she supports um, companies in their growth strategy, assist in the drafting of all uh, internal policies, conduct due diligence, uh, restructuring procedures and employment litigation. And at TELUS, Vera is also one of the lawyers in charge of the international mobility team, which provides uh, legal assistance on immigration matters. Um, okay, I will, I will hand over to you in a moment, Gonzalo and Vera, but before that, I would like to uh, let our audience know that this uh, session is interactive. So if you have any question at any point during the webinar, please uh, submit them. You have a little Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will put them to, uh, uh, to Gonzalo and Vera when the presentation is over. Okay, then Gonzalo, Vera, I'm uh, handing this over to you now. Uh, feel free to introduce the topic further and just um, uh, lead the conversation. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure for Telus, to me and to Vera, to, to be here with all of you today. Um, um, as, uh, as Alan just said, uh, our aim today is to, to share some thoughts, to provide some information regarding the teleworking, the remote work in Portugal, and also to provide you some, some information, some inputs regarding uh, uh, visas. Uh, I will be doing uh, the you know, presentation on, on the teleworking, and by the way, to talk about also the related topic on the right to disconnect. And then uh, Vera will bring us some, some thoughts on, on the visa-related matter. Uh, actually, nowadays, um, this uh, topic on mobility, international mobility, is becoming more and more uh, relevant in Portugal on a daily basis, actually. So that's why we have uh, considered that this could be helpful and of interest for, for all of you. So this being said, um, and uh, when, when we talk about Portugal, I would say that the first thing that, the first words that we remind immediately is weather, food, and nice people. Maybe uh, some of you, or I don't know, maybe many of you, uh, when we talk about Portugal, we recall about uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. But uh, yes, it's true. These are very relevant uh, uh, concepts and, and, and person for Portugal. But Portugal now is also becoming a very recognized, a very uh, uh, well-known country to, to, to work with very good conditions for the investment and also to bring up to the table new uh, ways of uh, organizing, of uh, uh, ruling the, the, the work. We see uh, on a daily basis, either through the incorporation of companies, either through the, cre the creation of hubs in Portugal, or even to have 
shared services that provide service uh, on a worldwide, worldwide basis, uh, we see uh, an increasing uh, interest uh, for the investment in Portugal. Another alternative that is, is also appearing a lot uh, during the last uh, months is, uh, uh, is to hire directly in Portugal while the, the company doesn't have any um, local establishment in Portugal. Uh, Portugal is known by uh, the know-how, the quality, the high qualified employees. And uh, this together with a good economic and political environment uh, was creating or is still creating the, 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 the interest and the and conditions for investment in Portugal. And so this was the background, uh, the, the context where uh, a, a new legislation has been approved and uh, start to be in place on January the 1st, 2022. Um, and it was funny in a way, because while we were talking about Portugal as an interesting place to go, a good investment uh, target, then suddenly by the end of last year, we uh, realized that uh, due to this new legislation, the, uh, the newspaper, the media abroad were just saying that working in Portugal became a nightmare. Actually, this was also a topic for a couple of jokes in the Daily Show. Uh, and so from one day to the other, apparently Portugal uh, um, uh, implemented a legislation on remote work and, on, and also regarding the right to disconnect that led, led investors to consider that Portugal was no longer interested. And the question that we raise is, is this really the case? Is, this, is, is it really the case that Portugal and the new legislation just uh, turn up the, 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 the situation and now it's a nightmare to, 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 to work in Portugal and actually to have remote work in Portugal? Well, if you allow me, before starting this, uh, replying to this, to this um, question, I would always like to recall uh, 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 an expression, uh, quote allegedly from Mark Twain, where, is, where well, apparently he said one day that reports on my death are greatly exaggerated. And I would say that the news uh, all over the world on this nightmare that just happened in Portugal are really, really exaggerated. So let's talk about this, this, um, this, this new legislation. As I said, entering into force on January the 1st, 2022. And the, the, the first and most likely the higher challenge and, uh, and topic that raised concern is uh, actually related to the right to disconnect. Uh, this is not new. Uh, this is something that we find uh, all over the, the, the world in many other jurisdictions. Actually, the, the pandemic also uh, brought the discussion around the right to disconnect to a, a different level. Uh, all of us have experienced the, the situation where you, you don't know where, where, when you start working and when you are ending your uh, work journey, uh, your, uh, your living room is at the same time your office. So the right to disconnect was actually brought to another, to another level. But the, the, the reason why this was a little bit surprising abroad, and also in Portugal, I must say, is that unlike other jurisdictions where the right to disconnect is, is considered as the right for the employee to say no, not to to, to be contact or not to reply, the Portuguese legislator used a completely different uh, approach. The approach was basically to uh, create a duty to abstain from, contra from, from contact from, the, from, the, from the, 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 the employer. Another way, instead of just talking about right to disconnect, the, the Portuguese legislator, legislation is um, uh, raised uh, an obligation to the employer 
by which the employer should prevent to contact the employee during the resting period. With an exception, the exception is when the contact is made uh, in a situation of force majeure. And, and uh, again, the question is, what does it mean, uh, force majeure? Is the, the legislation providing for any, for any clear concepts or definition? And the answer is no. Uh, we should go and use the, the, the principles of the civil law and to, to know that the, uh, the definition of force majeure act of God uh, is the one that implies a, an imperative need is indispensable to prevent or repair a serious damage, to avoid uh, an accident or to react uh, 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 to an accident. So it's quite difficult to, to, to narrow down the concept uh, of uh, force majeure for this purpose, and therefore quite difficult in this case also to know on whether a contact is, uh, is allowed or not, and the reply is expectable or not. Of course, the first reaction is, well, but uh, we work on, uh, on, on several jurisdictions. And if I am the, in the US and I'm sending an email to Portugal, I'm, I'm, I could be most likely contacting the employee during his resting period. Is the mere fact of sending this email uh, a breach of the law? Uh, well, the answer should, should, should be no. And that, that, that's the reason why uh, it was a, it exaggerated this panic around this, 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 um, this, this rule. Uh, it's not the simple fact that I'm sending an email to someone that is uh, in the resting period that uh, leads this act to be, a, to be a breach of the law. Nevertheless, uh, our recommendation is to have clear policies, clear guidelines for the company. In order to be uh, clear and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and proven that the company respects the resting period, that there is a, a, a concern around the work-life balance, and no one is expected to uh, answer to this, to this uh, to, to, to an email during the resting period, unless there are very exceptional uh, reasons uh, uh, requiring uh, an immediate uh, uh, reply. Actually, there are some com companies that uh, wanted to consider this within the scope of the uh, most uh, broad uh, work-life balance and, uh, and uh, are including these this, this rules also in some policies that are willing to take care of this concern. Some other companies are also including in their emails, in the footer of their emails, a clear, a clear expression saying that you are not expected to reply to this email unless you are uh, uh, requested to do so. Um, so in a way, uh, I would say that the panic around this, this, this rule is really uh, exaggerated and uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, very simple tools uh, uh, like policies would be, uh, would be uh, a good way to uh, avoid, to restrict the, 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 the risk of negative consequences for the company. So this is, as you see, uh, the really big topic that uh, led even daily show to make some funny uh, statements around working in Portugal. The other uh, topic that the Portuguese le legislation addressed with this new legislation is the, the teleworking agreement. Um, actually, this was not addressed for the first time. Unlike other jurisdictions where telework was not ruled, uh, or is, is being ruled for a very short time. Uh, in Portugal, we have uh, rules on uh, remote work for a while in the uh, Portuguese labor code. So we can say that this is not completely new for us. Uh, there, is, uh, there, there were already several rules and it was 
pretty much a matter of adjusting those rules somehow to the reality. Is this new legislation already uh, able and capable to provide proper answer to all the challenges? The answer is clear, no. But it's already a, a step forward uh, that wants to put Portugal uh, in terms of the remote work and how to rule it. So the first uh, uh, topic that needs to be uh, taken into consideration is the fact that remote work in Portugal needs to be uh, agreed in, in, in a written agreement. Uh, so informal verbal agreements on teleworking uh, or remote work are not allowed in Portugal. And this is quite important because the legislator wanted to be sure that the, the, the agreement uh, rules some uh, uh, mandatory and specific items, such as if it is a, a permanent remote work, it is an alternation, the place where the work is usually uh, carried out, the um, equipment and system, who should provide for this, who should set up the, the equipment, who should uh, provide for the maintenance. Uh, and then it's also interesting to see this. The legislator show a very a great interest around um, uh, being sure that the employee will not be staying alone. Um, that the that face to face meetings and contacts will be will be uh, made uh, on a regular basis because one of the um, important uh, concerns of the legislature also as a consequence of the pandemic again is the um, psychological consequences of being in a remote work alone without uh, working on a in a in a team environment on in and having face to face contacts so the the the, the telework agreement should be uh, done in writing and should have this uh, um, particular, particular conditions and requirements met. One of the challenges of the remote work in Portugal is the way uh, the same is construed uh, regarding uh, the, the, who is the entity that, uh, that is starting the intention uh, to, 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 to implement a remote work, meaning that if this is something that comes from the employee or if this is a request from the, from the company. And this is a challenge because according to the, this, unit, this new legislation, the, if, the, 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 if it is the, the company uh, proposing the telework agreement, the remote work regime, the employee is allowed to refuse it without providing for any uh, uh, justification or explanation whatsoever. Um, on the other end, and the other, other way around, if the, 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 the employee requests, for, requests this uh, remote working and the functions are compatible with this, uh, uh, this regime, the company is uh, uh, somehow obliged to accept this, this request and the only way to refuse it is to uh, is to do it in writing and with very clear and uh, uh, objective justifications for such refusal. So as you see, there is a challenge here because it's it's the the, the, the approach is not the same uh, whether the, the request is from the employee or the request is from the employee. But again, uh, when we have a challenge, we need to find the tools. To get to get a proper answer to the challenge, and uh, the law uh, provides for the possibility of the company to define the activities, the conditions under which the telework may be accepted. This is to say, the company is able to provide for a policy to rule the telework, and this is quite relevant, important, and in our view, quite advisable, because this way. The, the, the level of expectations from the employees would be uh, somehow uh, controlled. And the, even the reasons for the refusal uh, from the company would be quite clear and known before. So our, our recommendation on this regard is for the 
for the companies to uh, implement uh, quite straightforward and, and clear rules on the, the, the conditions for the telework in Portugal. Just a, a couple of uh, uh, um, additional uh, information on, on the teleworking conditions. We have now two different uh, uh, contracts with, uh, for the teleworking. One is the fixed term, which is a, a contract of, of up to six months, which can then be automatically renewable. And then is the, the teleworking agreement of uh, undetermined duration. Uh, as per our experience, and given the fact that this is a, a recent legal regime, the companies are typically uh, implementing the fixed term because they want to test. And actually, they are adjusting during the time the, the policies, the rules, and the way they are implementing the uh, telework regime in their own activities and organizations. Then one of the most controversial topics uh, when it comes to, to, to this new legislation on teleworking agreement. Uh, and it's a little bit uh, silly to see this because uh, instead of being uh, discussed the, the grounds, the reasons, the benefits, the advantages and the pros and cons on the telework regime, one of the um, somehow uh, controversial topics is around the expenses for the employees. Uh, this was something that was uh, a discussion during the pandemic because the, due to the lockdown for many, many months, the, the employees have been uh, obliged to work at home. Uh, and one of the discussions, actually this was something, uh, it was a discussion placed very, very many times by the trade unions. One of the discussions was around the the fact that the employees were having increased expenses mm, because they were working at, at, at home. And we are, when we're talking about increased expenses, we are considering uh, electricity, electricity bill and internet uh, connection, internet network connection costs. And for a while, trade unions were, were claiming that the employees were having increased costs and the companies were not paying those costs. So the, the way that the government, the legislator decided to, to give an answer to this, um, to this uh, concern was to state in this new legislation that the, that the company is obliged to pay the additional expenses that the employee can prove to have incurred as a direct consequence arising or arising from the, uh, from the uh, teleworking regime. So in a way, if the employee is able to prove the increased costs, then the, the, the company would be obliged to pay them. Well, in theory, this, this seems to be a, a good way to solve a problem, but actually uh, it created a, a, another one because the way the government uh, and the legislature um, defined uh, the, or considered to calculate the increased costs is to compare the costs that we have when we are starting the now the, the um, teleworking regime to compare them with the same months of the year before. You see, if for example, an employee is working uh, during, uh, is starting the uh, teleworking regime on uh, on uh, February 2022, um, the employee should compare the costs with those that he was paying for electricity and for internet connection on February 2021. Uh, but on February 2021, Portugal was in a, was experiencing a new or another lockdown. Many of, of us were working at home due to, to the mandatory teleworking regime. And in some cases, kids were also having their, their school uh, on a remote way. So um, it's not hard to, to, to foresee that most likely the employees will not be able to, to evidence for any additional cost uh, because 
by the time on, to, to, on February 2021, they were having already the same or probably most likely higher cost than today. So this was, uh, well, not a very uh, good and efficient way to and convenient way to, to solve this problem. And that is the reason why uh, the government is considering to, to, to change this rule and to uh, consider the, the payment of a monthly allowance, which by the way, some companies are doing now, but uh, unlike the additional costs, this monthly allowance for now would be taxable. So it's not good for the employee. It's uh, ultimately at the end of the day would be a, a cost that be an allowance that we would pay taxes. Two final uh, topics, very quick, just to uh, not to uh, avoid if I had to have enough time to talk about visas, but just two final topics on this new, new legislation. One is regarding privacy, employees' privacy, and the other regarding health and safety. Um, regarding privacy, the legislator needed to be clearly and strongly forbidding the, the, the use of images, sound, uh, and any other resources or means of control that may affect the employee's right to privacy. I know that this might sound a little bit silly, but we have been aware of some cases where the employers were asking for the employee to keep the camera on during the full work journey, just to be sure that the employee was really working. This is completely forbidden the employer can go to the, to the employee's workplace, can control the work activity, can see the work instruments. The, employee, the employer should provide for a 24 hours free notice to go home and to see the, um, this, 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 this instruments and the, the work activity, but should never, never do any action that would be uh, violating the privacy of the employee uh, to then control the, the performance from the employee. One final remark regarding uh, health and safety. As I said before, the legislator is quite concerned about the physical and mental aptitude of the employee uh, and the capacity to continue to work uh, on a remote way. So the, the, the legislator asks, the, le the law requires uh, uh, health uh, examinations before starting the telework and then on an annual basis to be sure that the employee is still, uh, is still, still in good conditions to be working alone. Uh, this is also quite important and is a final remark that I wanted to, 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 to do regarding work accident insurance policy because um, we are experiencing uh, some challenges with insurance companies because um, it's uh, harder for them to control the risk coverage and to know exactly uh, if the accidents occur during the work journey or while the, the, the employee was resting at home. So uh, it's, uh, our recommendation is to be sure and to verify with the, with the broker or with the insurance company if the work accidents policy is really covering the remote work. Otherwise, uh, we can have then uh, um, some bad surprises if something happens. So uh, this was a very brief and a very summarized uh, um, presentation on the new legislation. Hopefully, by the end of this uh, brief presentation, uh, the wrongful ideas on the nightmare that uh, just happened in Portugal are no longer there. But anyway, as I, as I said before, and Alan also said, we are, I would be more than happy to, to reply to any questions and to have your feedbacks and answers and, and, and comments if, uh, if, if handy. So thank you very much for your time. And now I give, give the stage to Vera. Thank you, Gonçalo. Gonçalo, um, good afternoon to you all. Um, uh, following uh, on the professional visas uh, subject, and uh, as mentioned by Gonzalo, in fact, on the, the past years, we have been observing an increasing mobility of employees to Portugal, uh, especially highly qualified ones, 
So our intention on this presentation is to give you some practical information on the requirements and procedure and timelines for professional visas to work in Portugal. Uh, we consider that this information is important, may, mainly because this uh, global mobility reality is demanding that both the candidate and the hiring company are aligned in terms of expectations on timings and visa requirements. And because we, we have that uh, practical view regarding the, the companies need to have a very well organized structure to assure that all formalities are accomplished in due time before the transference of employees, especially in the situations when residence permit is required. So within an international hiring process, the first thing that uh, it's necessary to access when thinking about moving to Portugal is to verify if a visa is needed. And we would say that this, this is something that should be verified both by the candidate and the company, even before a job offer is presented or accepted. So we have to um, differ differentiate two situations. If you are talking uh, about uh, Euro European Union citizens, um, they can move to Portugal to work and no formality will be required if they stay up to three months. If they stay longer than those three months, they must do a mandatory register at the local city hall, but that is the only procedure that must be accomplished from an immigration law perspective. That is to say that the process is really simple if we are talking about European Union citizens. But, if we are talking about non-European Union citizens, in fact, a visa to work in Portugal is mandatory. And the first rule to take into account is that the visa request should be presented at the country where the citizen is original from or he is legally living, okay? So the, the procedure to be taken into account by both candidates and companies would be ideally for the visa request to be uh, requested abroad, okay? Regarding the type of professional work visas, we can generically divide them in two. So the general work visa, which is usually called the, the D1 visa, and the uh, highly qualified work visa, usually called the D3 visa. This D3 visa, which is commonly known uh, better by this um, name, is being increasingly requested by companies and citizens. Uh, and it has become a day-to-day -day solution for qualified professionals to develop their career in Portugal. So you can ask what's the main difference between these two visas. They are both work visas, and the difference um, only relates to the fact that if you choose a D3 visa, a highly qualified work visa, it would be for uh, job positions requiring technical skills, specific technical skills, or specific academic qualifications for the job. So if we are facing one of these uh, situations, technical skills or specific academic qualification, you should um, choose the D3 visa. So um, if we are talking about uh, employees that fit uh, these conditions, the next step would be to verify the requirements to present this D3 visa with generic R, uh, generically are simply to meet because the promise of employment agreement or an employment agreement has to be prepared uh, with the candidate where it should be highlighted why that is an highly qualified activity. And this contract must have at least one year duration and the salary must comply with legal minimums which depend on the actual type of job. Okay. So these are the main requirements in order to uh, start for a D3 visa, a highly qualified work visa 
process. And about the submission, the submission of the, the visa process is um, by itself a simple procedure. So for purposes of submitting the visa requests, um, you should take into consideration that the requirements vary from country to country. So it's important to access um, each uh, situation in order to verify the concrete list of documents that must be presented with a visa request to check namely if it's necessary to legalize the documents and the way and place of presentation of those documents. So moving further on um, an information about the practical aspects of the presentation of the visa, we can say that generically the visa request can be presented either through the VFS services, which is a global service provider that operates in many, many countries. And for the countries where that service provider doesn't operate, the visa request is normally presented either through an online uh, portal, a Portuguese online portal called eVisa, or directly uh, towards the Portuguese uh, embassy abroad. Okay. One of the important questions that it's normally asked to us lawyers when we received a contact from a company we are working with within immigration laws or from a citizen that wishes to be hired for the company. So I would say that the main relevant uh, questions or at least the first question that is um, uh, presented uh, when uh, talking about visa procedures is timing. How much time will take this visa request? Because the company will say that I will need the, this employee to be working in Portugal in a couple of weeks, a, couple, a month, or the employee will say that he wants to be here uh, as up. So the answer is it depends from country to country, but we have actually good timings on visa issuance depending on the countries, as I say, but we can have uh, visas being issued in two weeks, which are really good timings from a perspective of um, visa issuance and other countries, which we know already what are those countries with uh, a little bit more delay of timings, which can take one, two, two, three months for the visa issuance. Okay, that's important. That, that is why it is important to access case by case and to evaluate the, the best solution to get the employees working in Portugal uh, and aligning the expectations between both parties. So usually when facing this timing issue, we can give important tips that will allow you to gain some time on the visa issuance procedure. So, the first one of those tips would be to anticipate obtaining some documents that we are aware that take um, time to collect, okay? For example, the criminal record in some countries, not in all countries, but in some countries, it can take a couple of weeks to be issued. So an important tip is when you are discussing a job offer, is all ready to collect that criminal record so that when the job offer is in place, the promissory agreement is signed, you already have that document that would take two more two or three weeks to get, okay? So typically this will make the procedure by itself um, be uh, faster managing by managing uh, collecting the documents earlier. Another tip is applicable for the countries where the VFS service provider has his services working, through which an appointment is scheduled for the visa presentation of the documents. So normally what we verify is that one of the difficulties is that not, not the actual timeline for the visa issuance, but sometimes in some countries uh, to get the appointment. 
Okay, so uh, when we are on the job recruitment procedure and we know that the company is moving forward or with the offer and the employee is going to accept that offer, one of the tips could be also to schedule the appointments in a couple of weeks counting uh, with the time that we will need to gather all the documents, but so that when we have all the documents, we all already have um, a schedule uh, appointment, okay? Um, for you to understand um, the visa procedure, uh, it, it takes uh, three steps, let's say it like that. So the first one would be the deliver of the documents at this VFS services or at the embassy. Then the embassy will receive the, the documents either directly or through the VFS services and will do a first analysis and then the final step, it's the decision by the Portuguese foreigners services. So in terms of steps, it is uh, an easy uh, procedure. So it's a matter of trying to gain time wherever we can. After the decision is issued um, by the local authorities, the Portuguese local authorities, it is then communicated to the embassy which notifies the citizen to collect the passport with the attached visa. So when we get here, we get to the good part. Uh, the visa is finally issued and the debt employee is allowed to come to Portugal on day one okay, of his visa issuance. So uh, that visa, which is delivered to the citizen, is valid for four months and will allow the candidate to travel to Portugal and start to working when he wants, when the company wants him to start. Afterwards, the visa holder, because this visa, as I say, it's temporary for four months. Afterwards, this, the, the, the visa holder will have an interview at the foreigner services, which is something that it's automatically scheduled by the embassy. And it's an interview which will allow him to get the residence permit, the final uh, title that allows him to work and live uh, in Portugal for two years, which is then renewable um, at a very simple way uh, through uh, online renewal processes. So this uh, residence permit, it's just a completion. It's uh, the phase two of the visa procedure. And uh, in a simple way of saying, the candidate will only have to prove that he is in fact working for that company and that he is in fact living in Portugal, inscribed in the social security, and then his residence permit will be issued and will be allowed to live and work in Portugal and freely travel to the Schengen space. So in terms of steps, uh, these are the, the legal, uh, and main steps regarding the issuance uh, of, a of a professional visa for Portugal. Um, we've been dealing with a lot of visas from a lot of countries, and uh, it's in fact a quite straightforward procedure, which in a lot of countries works uh, in a fast way. But uh, there are still, in, as in any case, changes that can be done to improve these procedures. So to um, turn Portugal uh, an even more attractive country for purposes of visa requests, there are additional measure, measures destined to simplify this procedure, which have been announced by the Portuguese uh, government a couple of months ago. Um, and that we think it's important to highlight within this webinar too, because we are convinced that they will in fact uh, bring um, uh, advantages uh, in obtaining the, the visas for Portugal. So it's for, it is foreseen that in a short term, the creation of a specific program which will be called Work in Portugal. And mainly it's destined to create a unique service, a specific, specific service for
for professional mobility. So something that will allow for all visa processes to be concentrated in one services. Uh, additionally, uh, it is foreseen the creation of a new visa, a temporary visa for uh, four months, which is a uh, destined soul for, with the sole purpose of allowing the entrance in Portugal to look for job opportunities, okay? So instead of someone entering as a tourist, someone entering enters, enters with a visa specifically, specifically and authorized to look for job in Portugal. Additionally, it is foreseen also a simplification of the visa procedures within the Portuguese speaking countries community, okay? Uh, eliminating that final stage of the procedure that I talked uh, earlier, which would be the foreigner services opinion. And it is foreseen that this uh, opinion uh, is um, dismissed in specific cases, which will for sure um, get the, the process faster. And at least, uh, but very important, considering the teams that Gonzalo uh, highlighted to the telework. Um, it is foreseen finally for Portugal, the creation of a new visit, visa for digital nomads. It is something that uh, already exists in uh, several European countries, but has not yet been uh, foreseen and it's not yet in force, although uh, discussed for a long time. But on this uh, program, this government program for 2022, it is foreseen that this uh, digital nomads visa will be created and it will be applicable not only for uh, employees uh, working for companies, but also for uh, independent ones, service providers uh, working on the, uh, their own. Okay, so we do think that this uh, digital visa, visa for nomads will be um, very important and will respond to a need that we will verify that is actual and it's not um, foreseen uh, in the law uh, by now, but we will think it will happen in short term. Okay, so um, with these um, measures that are foreseen for the future, we do understand that the um, visa procedures will benefit from it and it will, um, this global intention of simplifying it and reducing the associated bureaucracy will for sure benefit citizens and companies when deciding to move to Portugal. So these are the principal and main guidelines regarding the, the work visas. I am also available for any questions on this matter. Thank you. Yeah, if you allow me, just a, a final remark. Um, I may assure to all of, of you that are, that are in this session that uh, um, applying for a visa in Portugal is much more easy, it's easier and, uh, uh, and funnier than spending one hour listening to two lawyers talking about technicalities. But anyway, uh, maybe <laughs> you, you, you were able to, to get a rough idea on what uh, are the conditions and requirements and to confirm that Portugal is a very uh, good place to come to invest, to work and to live. So is these two boring lawyers were able to to uh, highlight and stress this, then this was already a very good session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gonzalo, Vera. Um, I haven't received any questions from the audience. I mean, your presentation was very comprehensive anyway, um, but I do want to encourage everyone on the session, you know, to uh, get in touch with uh, TELUS if you have any further questions about this. You know, do not hesitate to get in touch with Gonzalo, with Vera, the email addresses on the is on Telus's website. Um, before we close the session, uh, unless you've got anything to add, Gonzalo and Vera, I just want to thank you for uh, the presentation. It was uh, remarkably uh, useful. A uh, huge thank you to Telus, to you too, to the audience today. Um, and uh, I hope to see you at another 
webinar shortly. Thank you very much.